Welcome everyone. My name is Lori Dupree Brown, and I'm the director of the UW Madison Campus Wide 4W initiative that's for women and well being in Wisconsin and the world. Thank you for participating in our 2021 conference resistance and reimagination gender change in the arts. This is co convened with the UW system women and gender studies consortium and many other generous sponsors from around the state. I would particularly like to thank um, Dr. Stephanie Ritalotti, Olivia Dahlquist, Elizabeth Morris for their amazing leadership in putting this three day program together. And we're going to begin now because it's our first session of the day with um, a land acknowledgement and I'll be sharing, sharing my screen with you as, as I share that. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. And I would add today, reimagination. Today, UW Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths every day. I think what we're doing here today um, is very much in the spirit um, of that land acknowledgement. Um, so the session that you've arrived at um, is, um, is entitled Fem Femrite Art and Activism and Change. Ugandan women writers shifting the center. And here we have a chance to have some international leaders sharing their experience over decades of raising voices um, around social change through literature. I'm gonna share some guidance for how we can be connected and make, it, make this as much like a face-to-face -face interaction as possible. And then I'm going to introduce you to our session leader, um, Dr. Sandra Adele. During this presentation, please feel free to pose questions for the presenters in the Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. If you're having any technical issues, you can use the chat to write to one of our conference administrators and they will reply with help. There will also be closed captioning for this event by Northwest Court Reporters. So please see the chat if you are interested in having the captioning link. We are recording today's session and we will be sharing this um, once the videos are ready um, and captioned. And I'd also like to encourage you to please go come to our other sessions. There's also poster presentations from students and faculty around the state from many universities. And there's an artist exhibit on, re re on resistance and reimagination that has been curated by 4W Assistant Director Olivia Dahlquist, and that is available 24 seven as well. So please partake in the full feast that is this conference. Now I'd like to turn, it's a great honor, to turn to the introduction of Dr. Sandra Adele. Dr. Adele is a literature professor in the Department of African American Studies at UW Madison. And she is one of the scholars that enjoys the longest tenure there. And we look to her for leadership in many ways. She has published books and articles on African American literature. Her most recent publication uh, is Contemporary Plays by African American Women, 10 Complete Plays. Um, and that's from 2015. She has a couple of different book projects underway now. And her scholarship and teaching span the full full range of black literature which is quite unusual african-american francophone literature hispanophone and modern narrative she is a teacher actor director and linguist she speaks french spanish and arabic so there's nothing she doesn't know basically um, but she importantly most important to me she's an inspiring teacher and colleague and she's played a very special role role in 4w from the beginning 
because of her influence and encouragement, I can honestly say our program is infused with literature and the arts. And that would not have been the case without her advice in the beginning. And this session is yet another example of Dr. Adele's leadership in connecting us with global visionaries and literary leaders, helping us to amplify their work, connecting that to our student experience and experiences and hopefully um, creating connections for the future. So with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Adele Sandy. Um, thank you so much for bringing this session to the conference. Thank you so much, Laurie. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here and so excited. Uh, just a couple of corrections though. Um, I don't speak Arabic. I am studying Arabic and I have been studying it for a long time, but it's like, oh my goodness. When am I ever going to hold a conversation? Uh, I, my background is in comparative literature. And as I had mentioned earlier, I came to Madison, Wisconsin because of the um, tremendous uh, output or, or collection of, of books, articles on Africa that I could not get in Detroit when I was at uh, Wayne State University. And uh, I came uh, hoping to get into African, what was at the time African languages and literature, but since I didn't know an African language, I ended up in comparative literature. And that's where uh, the language background and negritude and so forth all came together. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues in the Department of Afro-American Studies, uh, the African Studies Program, Women and Gender Studies, I want to thank everyone who helped to make this symposium and especially this keynote address possible. And as you know, we had planned to bring uh, Goretti and I'm using the first names because uh, I don't want to slaughter their last names and they would reintroduce themselves. But we had um, planned to bring Goretti and Hilda to Madison for a week long residency. And we are still planning to do that when it's safe for them to get on a plane and travel. Um, last spring is when we wanted to do that. So we're so happy that we be, were able to coordinate with them to present the keynote address titled Femrite art, activism, and change. Ugandan women writers shifting the center, and we're doing that remotely uh, to avoid uh, technical issues. Uh, Hilda and Goretti are here, uh, and they will be live for the Q&A. Now, since this uh, theme of this conference is resistance and reimagination, gender, change, and the arts, we will open the session with a live poetry reading. Now, let me say that among the many rewards, not only of being a professor here, I love my job, I love teaching, but among, among the rewards of help, helping to put this event together is that I've had the opportunity to work with some beautiful and talented young women, um, Stephanie and Olivia. They have labored tirelessly to put this event together. And then also, we, we are cross-cultural, we are cross the transnational, international, uh, and intergenerational. And I've been working with Agnes, who re recently uh, earned a P, uh, MA uh, from Women and Gender Studies at the UW. She's now pursuing her PhD at the University of Kansas. And two current graduate students, and that's Om, uh, Omatola Okunlola and Astu Fagie. And they will each present, read a poem by a woman writer from their respective countries, that is Uganda, Nigeria, and Senegal. And so we await our readers. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Agnes Wibi Mayanga. I am a PhD student at the University of Kansas, but originally at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I'm glad to be here and nice seeing you all. Should I keep going with my poem? Okay. Well, uh, the poem I'm reading today is definitely from Uganda. It's written by one of our key note speakers, uh, Hilda uh, Twanjire. Um, the title is Greet Africa When You Return. I greet you, Africa. I greet you from Cape to Cairo. I hug you with arms of my sister from Somalia. She implored me. Greet Africa when you return. At Southern Theatre we met on a gray Scandinavian evening but the African sun still shone in her eyes. 
the effusive knife flowed into our handshake, connecting us in an embrace of what we share, of what we are. But I felt a fear tear into her voice. It trapped her tongue when she spoke. This place, my sister, sucks something out of you. So you are not you. You are you, but you are not you. Just greet Africa when you return. I greet you, Africa. I greet you with her sacrifice of tears. I dare cleanse you of blood stains that have denied her home. She implored me, tell Africa her children are broad a roadside stones. Thank you. Hi everyone. So I will be reading my poem next. My name is Tola Okunola. Um, I'm a PhD student at the African Cultural Studies Department. And um, I will be reading a poem by Lola Shonei, who is um, a Nigerian female. Poem is She Tried, and it's from a collection. So I was sitting, so all the time I was sitting on an egg. It's a really great book. Um, so here it goes. She tried to be a doctor, but they said the enamel paint on her talons stained the scalpel. She tried to be a lawyer, but they said as kids, way too high, distracted the judge. She tried to be a teacher, but they said her voice was too weak, not quite loud enough to control the children. She tried to be a writer, but they said she needed guts. And of course, that's phallic mind. So she tried to be a woman. They pat her on the back and showed her the kitchen, the garden, and the bed. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Astufal Gay. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of African Cultural Studies. My work is at the intersection of gender, sexuality, and language within the Senegalese uh, diaspora. Today, I'll be reading a poem by a Senegalese uh, poetess named uh, Fatou Yeli Fay. The poem was originally written in French. Uh, I'll be sharing with you the English translation of it. The title of the poem is called Come Back. Come back, come back to smell the rain, the scent of the wind after a long tornado, when dung and sand give off the smell of hummus mingled with the exhilarating air. Come back to walk on the bank near the seaweed in the stench of the dead fish and filth that have transformed this once clean bay into an ambulant detritus. Come back to dance to the sound of the djembe of the street children, cherubims, balls slung over their shoulders, so frail. Come back to sing with me the blues of the disenfranchised who no longer have hope and expect nothing anymore. Just come back to understand that deep in the abyss, we need a helping hand to help us go back up. Thank you. And thank you very much for those beautiful poems. And uh, to everyone here, this is the future of Africa. These wonderful, wonderful women, these young scholars who are working hard to achieve their PhDs. Um, and uh, it's just a pleasure uh, for me to be involved with them, to guide them, but also to be guided by them because there is a lot that I don't know that they're sharing with me. It's just wonderful. Now, um, before I um, introduce uh, Garetti and, um, and, and Hilda, I just want to say that um, 
just how I got involved with this, uh, with, with the Ugandan writers. I had known about film right for a long time, uh, but the putting faces to the, the, um, uh, the name didn't happen until 2019 when a colleague of mine, Kathy Perkins, who's a theater historian, she's written, um, uh, edited several anthologies on African women um, playwrights, came to Madison to do a presentation at Africa at Noon, at the African Studies Africa Noon uh, series. And among, she had a PowerPoint pre presentation and among the final slides that she showed was the advertisement, was a, a, a flyer announcement for uh, the um, 2019 International African Women's um, a writers' conference to be held in Kampala, Uganda, and I said I'm going, <laughs> and it was just a wonderful experience. I mean, the rooms were packed with people uh, listening to the the keynote speaker was uh, Jackie Kay, one of the keynote speakers, and others. Uh, and I also had an opportunity to sit in with G Garetti when she was working with a group of very very young aspiring uh, writers, and it was just an incredible experience. And I was saying to myself, I need to bring her and Hilda to Madison. Uh, Garetti is one of Uganda's leading novelists. She holds a PhD in creative writing from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, uh, South Africa. Her debut novel is The First Daughter. It was published in 1996, followed by Secrets No More in 1999, which won the Uganda National Literary Award for best novel in that same year. In 2002, she published a novella, Whispers from Vera, her third novel, Waiting, was published by the Feminist Press in New York in 2007. In 2014, she published The Essential Handbook for African Creative Writers. And she has also published short stories and children's books. Uh, like Hilda, uh, Garetti is a founding member of, F of Femrite. Uh, Ugandan Women Writers Association and Publishing House. And, and she worked as its first director for 10 years, and that is from 1997 to 2007. In 2009, she founded and is now the director of the Africa African Writers Trust. And I think she will have time to tell us about the new directions that uh, the trust is taking. Um, and that organization aims to bridge the divide between African writers and publishing professionals living in the diaspora, and that's everywhere and on the continent, bringing them together in order to promote synergies between groups. And that's what, exactly what we're doing here and now. She was the first, Goretti was, a uh, Ugandan woman to receive an international writing, uh, writing program fellowship at the University of uh, Iowa. And most of you know that it's a very prestigious um, uh, writing uh, program. And she has since participated in many literary events internationally. In 2013, Garetti was one of the five international judges for the Commonwealth Book Prize, and Garetti uh, divides her time between the UK and Uganda. Hilda is a Ugandan feminist, a mother, and a member of different women empowerment uh, initiatives, including, of course, Femrite, uh, Action for Development, and the Pan-Africa uh, Gra uh, Graca Michael Trust Fund, uh, Trust Women in Media Network. She is Femrite's current uh, executive director, and this is the, a position that's enabled her to initiate and contribute to several actions for the advancement of women writers uh, in, uh, in Africa. And one of the projects that she has been involved with now uh, recently is uh, collecting stories of South Sudanese women uh, in refugee camps. She's a member of the uh, Permanent uh, Bureau of African, Asian, Latin American Writers Union and the National Book Trust of Uganda. She received the Uganda uh, Government National Medal in recognition of her contribution to women empowerment and emancipation through the literary arts. She is a recipient of the Women for Women Award, Uganda 2018, uh, and Uganda Registration Services Bureau Recognition Award, tw also in tw uh, 2018, for her contribution to Uganda's cultural and literary arts. She holds a master's degree, uh, master of arts degree in public administration and management from Makerere uh, uh, University in Kampala. And she is a publisher of her short stories and poetry and creative nonfiction and the editor of several literary works by women writers. So please everyone welcome Goretti and Hilda.
So now we're going to go to a video. And I just want to give everyone um, to have the full experience. If you do have a panel of photos, um, if you want to minimize that, you'll be able to fully see your, your full screen without that. And if you, if you click on, um, there's a three bars there, you'll see like a tic-tac-toe board and then there's a flat line. If you click on that little flat line, it'll minimize that and you can kind of scoot it out of the way. You'll be able to see the video well, but I just wanted to give you that tip. And with that, we will, we will turn to the video. One moment, please. To be speaking to you today at these four women. Okay, now we got it perfectly. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be today. I'm delighted to be speaking to you today at this four women conference at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Thank you for inviting me. I'll start my presentation by giving you the introduction. Introduction. The establishment of femrights in 1996 marked a turning point in Ugandan literature. In the past two and a half decades, femrights' existence has changed the face of writing and publishing in Uganda and Africa as a whole. The accolades for African writing. Monica Arash Dinyeko was in 2007 awarded the Kane Prize for African short story writing while the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Africa region was won by Doreen Bangana in 2016. Violet Barunji's unpublished play, Over My Dead Body, won the British Council International New Writing Award for Africa and the Middle East region. To date, some of the books published under the Femrite Publishing House imprint are taught in Ugandan schools and higher institutions of learning. These include Mary Caroro Okrut's The Invisible Weaver, published in 1999, Susan Chiguli's The African Saga, published in the same year, and Tears of Hope, a collection of short stories by rural Ugandan women, published in 2003. Some of Femrights' founding members established notable literary outfits which promote and develop writers, such as the Babishai Naiwe Poetry Award, founded by Beverly Nambozo, Goretti Kiomhendo, myself, founded the African Writers' Trust, Ayeta Ann Wangusa, established Kausha Development East Africa, and Jackie Budesta Batanda started Success Parks. A number of Femrite members have published outside Femrite's publishing outfit, such as Glyda Namkasa, published by Macmillan, Mildred Barrier by Marlowe International UK, and myself by the Feminist Press in New York. How did Femright come about? I'll give you a little background. Femright did not emerge out of a vacuum. The organization's birth, rise to prominence and growth followed in Uganda's great literary and cultural tradition especially as witnessed in the 60s, the years immediately following the country's independence from her British colonial masters. Uganda then was known as the literary pride of Africa and cradle for African literature. As a literary cradle, Uganda has been home to great writers around the world since the 1960s. For example, Kenyan heavyweights Ngugi Wathiong wrote his first novel, The River Between, 
as a literature student at Makerere University and playwright, activist, and poet, Michelle Mugo, also did her undergraduate studies at Makerere. American travel writer, Paul Theroux, Nobel Prize laureate, V.S. Naipaul, and David Rubadiri from Malawi, all taught at Makerere University. Other prominent writers who have lived in Uganda include Giles Foden, author of the novel, The Last King of Scotland, which is set in Uganda and was released as an Oscar-winning film in 2007. Somali writer Nuruddin Farah, a constant nominee for the Nobel Prize in Literature, also lived in Uganda. In addition, Ali Mazrui, the celebrated Kenyan scholar, began his academic career at Makere University in the 60s. And Peter Nazareth, Professor of English and advisor to the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa, was born in Uganda and educated at Makerere University. Uganda's rich literary culture was reflected in the hosting of the African Writers of English Expression Conference in June 1962. It was the first ever African Writers Conference. It was attended by renowned writers such as Chinua Achebe, Wole Shoyinka, Ama Ata Eidu, Grace of God, and many others. The third edition of the Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies Conference, a class, followed in the early 70s, making Uganda the first African country to host the gathering. The launch of Transition Magazine in 1966, a leading forum for intellectual debate, which published writers from across the continent, was another indication of Uganda's vibrant literary scene. And perhaps more crucially, was the publication of Song of Lawino by Okot Pabitek in the same year, unquestionably the best non literary work to have emerged out of Uganda. Song of Lawino launched Anglophone Ugandan literature to a receptive worldwide readership. And then things fell apart. By early 70s, however, right through the 80s, the promising literary output that had characterized the previous decade suffered devastating setbacks, most prominently during the reign of Uganda's notorious third president, Idi Amin, who ruled Uganda for eight years, from 1971 to 1979. Idi Amin was responsible for gross political and economic mismanagement, ethnic persecution, notably the expulsion of nearly 80,000 Asian Ugandan population in 1972. An estimated half a million people are believed to have been killed through state-sponsored violence. Many writers such as Okela Ochuli, Austin Bukenya, and Richard Ntiru fled into exile. Others were killed, like the playwrights Robert Serumaga and Byron Kawadwa. Many others went silent. It was too dangerous to write. The silencing of writers was echoed by Taban Lo Leong, Africa's foremost writer, poet, and critic, when he declared Uganda a literary desert in his book of essays, The Last Word. This was a far cry from the literary productivity that had characterized the previous decade. The political situation did not improve much, when Milton Obote took over power for the second time in 1985, leading to more cultural and economic decline and silencing of writers. The rise of femme right. The 90s dawned with optimism. After five year guerrilla war, Yoweri Seven captured power in 1986, overthrowing Milton Obote. This ushered in a period of relative stability. International publishing houses, such as Oxford and Macmillan, which had fled the country, began to return. 
Fountain Publishers, Uganda's first indigenous publishing house was established in 1988, which would later publish my first novel, The First Daughter in 1996. The Uganda women's movement flourished, promoting, promoting women's rights and advancing women's causes in different spheres. As Uganda began the process of rebuilding as a country, so did the Ugandan writers, and in particular, women writers whose voices had been missing during the literary boom of the 60s. When Femright was founded in 1996, only a handful of Ugandan women had been published. This included Barbara Chimenye, dramatist and playwright Elvania Namkwaya Zirimo, and novelists Jane Kironde Bakaluba, Mary Karoro Krut, and Lillian Tindiewa. Where were the women storytellers? Women are the traditional storytellers in Africa. They are the custodians of stories. If women were telling their stories, why were they not being published? My own grandmother, Zebia Nyamaizi Aboli, was a wonderful storyteller. She introduced me to the art of storytelling, but her stories were considered transient and frivolous because they dealt with trivial issues, such as fairy tales, fables, and myths. Moreover, my grandmother's arena was the fireplace. Her audience, us, her grandchildren. In comparison though, my grandfather would have told heroic stories about war and conquer, about successful hunting sessions. His stories were considered serious and were accorded attention. They were shared in public domains, such as bars, and wrestling grounds where audiences were larger. Recounting the first 10 years of femrite, 1997 to 2007. When femrite was born, these were the issues we wanted to address. I directed femrite for the first 10 years, 1997 to 2007. Our main concern at the time was why women writers had been and continued to be excluded from the publishing enterprise. Why women's stories were not accorded the seriousness they deserved. The cohorts of women writers who joined Femright in the early years were hungry to tell their stories and have them published. But the main issues hindering the women from achieving their goals were lack of self-confidence and personal empowerment to write and publish their stories. We were keen to establish what had led to women writers to lose their self-esteem, why they were practicing self-censorship while writing their stories. Was it a cultural dynamic? In the African tradition, a woman's identity is constructed using that of another. For example, a mother will be identified by her child's name, Mama Musoke, which means mother of Musoke. Or if she is married, she may be known by her husband's name. Taking on a husband's name in some African societies is different to how it is perceived in the West. For example, if one's husband is called Gasana, the wife will append the prefix muka, which is a possessive noun, pronoun, which means wife of, to the root of her name. She will henceforth be known as muka gasana, which literally means wife of gasana. When a woman's identity is pegged to another person's, her confidence to tell the stories in her heart is bound to be restricted. What will people say when the wife of Gasana or the mother of Musoke writes in the first person narrative voice? I was raped on my wedding night. Even as a sentence in a fictional narrative, it may come across 
as if it was Gasana's wife or Musoke's mother who was raped. A woman writing such a sentence may opt to either leave it out completely or use the third person voice. Nakato was raped on her wedding night, which diminishes the emotional impact of the whole story. The first programs we ran at Framright aimed at building the women writers' confidence to tell the stories in their hearts through self-empowerment and skills development workshops. The trainings focused on issues such as, what does it mean to be a woman writer? An African woman writer. What tools do you require to tell the stories in your hearts and not in your minds? In addition, the association offered several benefits to its members, a home and an identity were first and foremost. The firm right office was more than an office. It was a space deliberately created to provide a home base for the members. The home offered a place where women writers would have an emotional and physical space to create, to hold communion with other writers, to share their frustrations, and to give affirmation to what they were doing and most importantly, feel safe to pen their stories. As a profession and career, writing is not easily understood or appreciated in Africa. Femrite validated and gave meaning to women's writings, particularly by publishing and promoting their works. The name Femrite was coined to reflect the association as a gender-defined entity. Femme or female standing for our gender identity and right for our professional identity. Femme Right Publications Limited, the publishing arm of the organization, was set up in 1999. With no prior experience in publishing books, we went ahead and launched our first six titles in 2000 a short story anthology, four novels, and one poetry collection, all written by femrite members. We did not only publish books, but went ahead to promote, market, and sell them. We traveled abroad to promote our works, participating in the London Book Fair, Frankfurt Book Fair, Zimbabwe International Book Fair, and many others. To date, Femrite is still going strong, with over 50 publications and a membership of nearly 150. As Hilda, the current Femrite director, will elaborate in her presentation. I thank you, Hilda. Thank you. All protocol as observed by the previous speakers. I greet you all. My name is Hilda Tuonjeire, and I'm really very honored to be here tonight. On behalf of FemRight, Uganda Women Writers Association, I'm very grateful to the planners of this symposium for inviting us to deliver this keynote address. Allow me to start by acknowledging the women who came before us and upon whose shoulders we stand. Our mothers, our aunties, our teachers, our colleagues, and all the women we have met on our life journeys. I do this in recognition of the important tenet of the For Women initiative, the well-being and full participation of women in Wisconsin and the world over. Despite the periphery positioning assigned to women, we all know that the well being of society weighs heavily on women's shoulders, tending to children and young people and giving care to family and community members to ensure their well being and security. Yet, worldwide, the security of women seems to be no one's responsibility. 
in Uganda 2018 and 2019 were the, the darkest of times regarding the security of women. Every day, a woman or two got murdered in Kampala city and its suburbs. In March 2021, Sarah Everard, whom you all probably uh, heard about, was murdered in East London uh, as she returned from a friend's house. That this happens in these two worlds, Kampala and London, shows just how unsafe women can be in the world, anywhere in the world. This is a woman's daily reality. I pay tribute to the women who have lost their precious lives at the hands of ruthless humans. As women writers, we have a responsibility to speak out and to speak against this brutality and to document these happenings through fiction, drama, true life narratives, poetry, and all other forms of writing. As one of the great thinkers of her time, Zora Neale said, if you're silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. Alice Walker echoes this sentiment in her novel Possessing the Secret of Joy, where her character Tashi speaks against female circumcision. She says, if you lie to yourself about your own pain, you will be killed by those who will claim you enjoyed it. Positioning femwright as a creative force. Our theme tonight, femwright art, activism, change, Uganda women writers shifting the center becomes even more relevant to the times than it was in 2019 when we were first invited to be part of this convening. I would like to pay tribute to Honorable Mary Karoro Okrut, the founder of FemRights, that today we are part of the community of the University of Wisconsin, Madison, celebrating the well-being of women and their full participation in society, and that we are part of the women who recognize the unfair positioning of women in society and choose to be part of the wave dismantling this anomaly is phenomenal. We have come a long way from creaking chairs in Karoro's office at Makere University to essential spaces such as this and the spaces my colleague Goretti just spoke about. A few months back, I visited a community and the professor I was seated with introduced me as a fellow professor. When I got up to speak, I started by apologizing that I was not a professor, but that professors enjoy teasing people I said it was a dream yet to be achieved. Later, when I went back and took my seat, the professor told me he was not joking. He said, if I was in a different part of the world, probably I would be a professor considering the number of works of literature I have facilitated into existence. As I prepared this presentation, I remembered him. This invitation validates his statement and validates the work FemWrite and other literary initiatives do in creating opportunity for writers to grow into a formidable force. It is a privilege to be part of this convening, especially during such times when the world is under attack a time when COVID has proved to us that what we consider as constants may not really always be constants. We are in a time of inconsistencies where writers and writers initiatives need not only to survive, but to remain relevant to the times. During lockdown, for instance, we found ourselves on top of a pickup truck offloading 
not reading and writing materials for our uh, school writing clubs, but food rations for writers. We found ourselves trapped at home listening to pronouncements that the arts and creative sector is a non-essential sector that must stay home. Yet, as writers, this is the time to be out, to bear witness to the COVID-19 storm and all the scandals, women, and all, the and all its scandals. The woman banned with cooking oil, kicked by a law enforcement officer on duty. A grandmother caned by a drunken grandson for the sins of his father. The pregnant teenage girl on the red street fending for family. The over 1,000 fathers who have defiled their daughters in Uganda. And the list goes on. Activism and change. The act of writing is an act of activism. Writers write to be read. They write with hope of making an impact and creating change. Femrite is no exception in her quest as her activism takes on two major strands, gender activism and literary activism. I would like to locate this conversation between two interesting newspaper articles one by Bernard Tabaire and the other by Glenna Gordon. In the formative years of Femrite, as uh, uh, Goretti has explained, the organization published and launched five books at once. We had the launch at Makere University. A journalist, Bernard Tabaire, wondering about the ambition of the organization wrote an article where, she st where he stated that the organization had published the books probably to justify donors' funds. Maybe he was right. How does an amateur organization with only uh, a volunteer editor bring out five books at once? And likely, these were thoughts of many other people but as David Kaiser would later write in another article titled Women Writers Rule, the accusations stopped at whispers. At that time, there was only one indigenous mainstream publishing house in the country, uh, Fountain Publishers. The rest were multinationals. Femright broke the ceiling then a position that takes us to the second article by Glenna Gordon in 2007, where she wrote, uh, Uganda women writers shine, where are the men? Later in 2011, Dennis Muhumza wrote another article, as women excel, where are the male writers, which amplified Gordon's question women writers in Uganda were beginning to shift the center and cause ripples. Gender activism. Accomplished writer and academic, Professor Pumla Dineo Gola, who I have so much respect for, in her keynote address at Femrite at 20 celebrations in uh, 2016, stated that while some people riot with placards on streets, writers riot with pens, a statement she later reiterates in her book, uh, Reflecting Rogue Inside the Mind of a Feminist. Since inception, Femright has consistently worked towards developing and empowering women through writing and reading in 2018, I was pleasantly surprised by the government of Uganda when I was awarded a national medal for, uh, for contribution to the empowerment, of, empowerment and emancipation of women through literary arts. In 2019, the chairperson of Femrite, Dr. Masi Ntangare, was also awarded the same medal for contribution to theater development in Uganda. 
these medals and all other national and international accolades that femrite members have scooped are not about us but about the significant position femrite occupies not only in contributing to uganda's uh, literary heritage but also in bringing women's voices into the public discourse challenging and changing the gender narrative in a country like uganda where women's mental health is not a priority writing as a form of activism is crucial for women's well-being it enables women to interpret their lives their lives and experiences into stories it is worth noting therefore that femrite and other women's literary initiatives have contributed significantly to women's well-being by giving them safe spaces for self-expression and awareness in turn their works become a safe space of learning and self-reflection for readers. These efforts have not been towards Uganda women only. The organization has also championed regional programs such as the Regional Residency for African Women Writers. And on this note, I would like to appreciate the incredible women of the continent who have participated in facilitating our residencies. Uh, Ellen Banda from Zambia, Helen Moffat from South Africa, Zukiswa Uwena uh, from South Africa and, and, and Zimbabwe and Kenya, and Doreen Baingana from Uganda. The residency has led to the publishing of more African women in anthologies and to better lobbying and advocacy activities for gender equality and equity. In addition to fiction, Femrite has published issue-based books for use in, uh, in pushing for social reforms and social justice, books like Tears of Hope, Farming Ashes, Today You Will Understand, I Dare to Say, and Beyond the Dance. We've also engaged in literary activism. When Femrite came into existence in 1995-96, development partners were scouting for initiatives to support. We operated fairly comfortably through, although there were critical challenges of setting up the organization. Later, donors were shifting focus and finances for the arts and uh, the arts later donors were shifting focus and finances for the arts sector were dwindling we no longer had the luxury of working individually because we recognized sector challenges we all grapple with uh, our gender notwithstanding the organization started to support budding male writers as well to publish them in some of the anthologies. But we kept a clear guard of women's special space in femrite. We started to hold lobbying and advocacy activities aimed at improving the sector, increasing writers' visibility, and popularizing Ugandan literary works. We organized with other writers and publishers and held meetings with uh, Ministry of Education, the National Curriculum Development Center, and others. And our efforts led to major reforms. So, and now there are more works by Ugandan writers on the curriculum uh, of, on the school and university and other colleges curriculum. But we want more reforms because male writers have continued to dominate the curriculum, keeping women at the margins of uh, knowledge production. We have had uh, regional and international partnerships and collaborative projects uh, in later years. Uh, uh, we, we have, we, for example, participate in uh, the Pan-African Writers Association and Pan-African Asian Writers Union 
activities. Uh, in 2013, we started to co-publish the Kane Prize for African Writing. That's one, you know, the most prestigious prize on the continent. 2014, we started to uh, work with African Women, African Women's Development Fund to implement an annual workshop on writing for social justice raising women's social political consciousness. In 2018, we worked with Grasha Marshall to in South Africa for, to organize a conference that discussed and reflected on the future of the continent and likely areas of influence for women. 2019 and 2020, we worked with the International Shiro's Union to do different activities, a conference, uh, raising funds during COVID. And we, uh, we worked with Oxfam to host a writing retreat for South Sudanese women. The retreat, the result of the retreat is a book titled No Time to Mourn. And uh, Stephen Wendu commenting on the book, he's a piece activist from South Sudan, he says, this book is a foundation, a great tool for policy and decision making towards a better South Sudan. I do not know how to clearly write my observation, but sincerely, this is a very important piece of work that gives birth to a new beginning for South Sudan. So that is how uh, people have interpreted the literature that has come through Femrite. But what is next for Femrite and the creative sector in the new world of COVID? In the shadows of COVID, of 2020 COVID-19, Femrite initiated yet another crucial project titled Memoir Writing for Women's Leadership cultural preservation and exchange, where uh, 31 Ugandan women and 31 American women are working together to produce a book about cultural experiences and how these shape women's lives and their contribution to national and international development. I must at this point pay tribute to Professor Sandra Adele who without knowing inspired this project into existence. In her memoir, Confessions of a Slot Machine Queen, Professor Adele speaks about her personal story of teenage pregnancy and how she was told that she would have to give up her baby for adoption because she was too young and had no means of looking after the child. When Sandra's grandmother visited, she said to Sandra's father, son, this isn't something colored people do. We don't give up our babies. We don't give our babies away. We always find a way to feed one more child. This cultural reference from grandmother immediately shifted the conversation to a whole new level of generosity and resilience of a people. That was the trigger for this project. And now, more than ever before, we must think of how to survive beyond this era. The answer probably lies in how we innovate more ways to strengthen human connectedness through literature and how we pave our way, we pave way for ourselves onto the decision-making tables where national and international budgetary allocations are decided. For Femright, as with other literary initiatives, the pinch of COVID has been unprecedented. Some of you might even have received a letter from us asking for financial support to pay rent and other basic services. Yet, Femrite is home almost to all Ugandan writers and literary initiatives. We host informal and formal sector meetings. 
but COVID-19 almost tipped over this truth, reminding us of the need to own a home of our own where no one would knock for rent. My, as my colleague has stated, Femrite has given birth to several initiatives in the country through both members and associates of the organization. Whereas the organization enjoys the goodwill and support of these initiatives, it still remains without a home. This year, Femrite 25 years. The organization has remained steadfast in its great value of sisterhood. As Margaret Cremont notes in her article, writing to keep on living, it is three, if not four generations of women that come together in this small house on Kila Road, Kampala. Some were born before independence of the country in 1962. Others have never known the time of dictatorship of Idamin or Obote. Yet, their age gap, their ethnic and language differences have no consequence in this place. This is a place where women come together to write and by writing and publishing to change the world for themselves their daughters and granddaughters. I thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, um, everyone. I am so, uh, I, it's kind of hard to speak, <laughs> moved. I'm totally, totally inspired. I mean, this has been, you know, beyond my expectations. I, you know, because we're online, but this was so beautiful, everybody. Also, I want to say that um, the, I, I think I spent about two weeks in, in Uganda in 2019. So I was at the big conference, uh, essentially invited myself. Um, and, and gave a presentation there about my memoir, which had nothing to do with Africa, it was about uh, you know gambling. Uh, but it was uh, surprising to me even that even after the large count, uh, uh, event, I had several young women come to me to talk about their mental health issues and where they could not address these things openly. And they were glad that I expressed this. And likewise, Hilda, thank you so much, and Goretti, and Mercy, uh, who uh, helped to organize my, uh, my trip uh, in, in my visit. I actually had the opportunity to be at film right this was another big thing and i had pictures of it you know with me looking at the big sign uh in that space that uh, hilda uh was talking about and i also want to point out uh, real quickly that we just hilda we just got um uh, a welcome and a, a hello to you from fatu yali Faye, one of senegal's most famous uh women uh, writers. And it, it, that's just absolutely, you see, we're just doing this international thing. Um, are there, okay, um, the, uh, one of the questions that we have, and this is from Marie Kruger, and that is, can you tell me more, tell us more about the situation of women writers in contemporary Uganda now? Uh, and I think in, to some extent you've already commented on um, what the women uh, are doing. Uh, Hilda, you want, can you talk a little more about uh, that? You already did say, in fact, that some of you are just you know, working and, and helping to deliver food to people. Um, Hilda, can you comment a little more about the, the, what's happening right now uh, with FemRight or Goretti? Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you all uh, who are here. Thank you for listening in and thank you for the questions uh, that are coming in. We really, really appreciate being in the space with you and thank you, Sandy. Um, what we are doing uh, right now, yes, as uh, as Sunday already said, at some point we were actually trying to raise money uh, uh, for, for, for food 
which we were sharing as a community, a community of writers, we would just send out messages and say, who needs this? And who needs this? And who needs this? And uh, we would just say, so come to them, right? And then the women themselves were bringing some things. And so we, it, um, I feel that this situation has even strengthened our community, yeah? And then um, regarding some of the changes, it's pretty much of what most of the people are doing. Like for example, now we are doing a lot of things uh, on Zoom online. We are doing a lot. Uh, we were disrupted a little bit with the shutting down of Facebook, mm -hmm. but we had started to have a number of activities uh, on Facebook because COVID is still a reality, it is still with us, and we do not want to infect each other. Uh, we still have some physical activities that we do together, but we follow the guidelines. We, we, there's, um, there's government guidelines, but some now we actually do it for ourselves not because government is uh, is forcing you to do it but you get into a space we still for example have our readers writers club every monday and we distance we we wear masks and we you know, we sanitize we have a, um, a little signage wash your hands yeah so we are still we are still doing that and then the other um, the other very very crucial aspect uh, that, that uh, we are doing now is strengthening our connections with other writers and literary uh, initiatives and individuals uh, beyond Uganda, within Uganda, but also beyond uh, beyond Uganda. And it's interesting that now we actually have more, when we have activities, we do have more, uh, more international participation than before, which is an opportunity. It, first, it started as a coping mechanism but now it has become an opportunity to, uh, to have more partnerships, more collaborations beyond, uh, beyond the country. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe the other something also very important, the, the government has in place provides for a national culture forum. And so as femright, uh, the forum is taking shape and it's for lobbying, lobbying government to recognize the creative sector, to put at the center the creative sector so that it also uh, gets budgetary allocations and all, and all the recognition. So femright is one of the nine, nine initiatives on board which is negotiating with government right now to ensure that we get that space um, uh, to be recognized by government. Yeah, uh, Goretti can add. Yeah, Goretti, also you have an, a new initiative going on that you just uh, sent, uh, I think it was last week, a note about, uh, which it, it extends the reach of uh, Ephemerite and the African Writers Trust. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, thank you, Sandy, and uh, thank you everyone who is listening in. Greetings from an evening in Kampala. It's, it's, it's getting dark, <laughs> but we can still see each other. So I am currently the director and founder of the African Writers Trust. I'm sorry if you can hear noise in the background. That's my neighbor chopping wood. <laughs> <laughs> That's this <laughs> one. <laughs> we are going to cook dinner. <laughs> so we have just initiated the African Writers Trust Training Center. And this is a space that will where contributors of literature can come together, can gather. 
to focus on their craft development, to learn, to share their experiences, to engage in reading and writing activities, and really enjoy a conducive atmosphere which uh, enables them to develop and write, the, uh, to develop their writing and, and publishing projects to higher standards. So we launched this in January of this year, and some of the programs that we shall be offering at this center include short courses in creative writing, in editing, and in publishing, manuscript assessment program, which offers quality up manuscript appraisals by experienced and established readers worldwide, and also a reading and writing residence. So, so this is a, a new program, the writing and reading residence, whereby not only writers and book lovers will gather, but also editors and publishers, all people interested in, in, in books, in writing and reading, will come for a one week long residence at the center. And the, mainly the purpose of this program is after the realization that most of us are not reading enough. Mm -hmm. Most of us have failed to find the time to focus on our reading. We are writing, we are publishing, we are traveling, but we are not reading enough. So this residence is meant to give book lovers and people other from the book sector the opportunity and the space and the time to read. So that's about the new initiative that we are offering at the African Writers Trust. Thank you, Garetti. Uh, and that's really good for us to know here um, in Madison, Wisconsin. And let's see what we can do. Uh, to help uh, give people, uh, some of the women and, and writers an opportunity. Um, we, and I, I wanna know from um, Astu, uh, Tola or Agnes, if you have a question, but before that, I wanna show you our books. These are FemWrite books, lady, uh, uh, folks. Um, uh, and at the front, you have uh, Goretti's books. And I want, please also um, be sure to let Susan uh, Ikiguli know that we also have a copy of her poetry, uh, another film write writer. We're very excited about this. And I want to thank, we all thank uh, Emily Songolo, who is a librarian here, who has developed um, this wonderful collection of books of all kinds from all across the African continent. Uh, these are library books and uh, they're not available right now because I have them in my lap, but I will be getting them back soon um, to, um, to the library. Are, are there any questions from um, our, our scholars? Uh, Astu, Tola, Astu, it's so exciting that we got uh, Faye Yelly, uh, Fatu Yelly Faye. Yes, she <laughs> joined the panel and I have read her poem earlier. I guess uh, I do have a question. First of all, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you to, to Hilda and Goretti for coming here and sharing your work with, with us. Uh, my question is more on the issue of language and accessibility. Yeah. I'm wondering if you only, if in within your, your group, what, what languages do you do you use? Are your work only in English? Uh, are the Ugandan women uh, who don't speak English, maybe do they have access to those work, et cetera? So how do you deal with uh, the language issue within your writings? I'll go. I was... Goretta, are you going first? I can, I can go first. So perhaps I can talk about my own experience as a writer. I, I write in English. And I know it's, it's, a, it's almost a political question. Why do you write in English? Why don't you write in your mother tongue? And why, don't you, why do you write in a foreign language? So for me, my answer to that question usually is, I don't consider English a foreign language anymore 
because I was introduced to the English language when I was about probably five years old, when I first went to school. Before that, I was being raised my, by my grandmother in a small town in Western Uganda, where I exclusively spoke and thought and behaved and did everything in my, in my mother tongue. But once I went to school at the age of about five, six, I was introduced to the English language. I started using the English language. I would be punished if I didn't speak English. So how can English be a foreign language anymore after more than 50 years? So I write in English because for me, literature is more than anything. It's about expression. It's about putting my ideas out there. So if I can express myself better in English than in my mother tongue, I don't, I don't really see a contradiction in that. And if I wrote in my mother tongue, there are about probably half a million users of my mother tongue in Uganda. Uganda is a country with over 50 local languages and the, the national language, we, we don't have, we don't have, we don't have, it's not a national language, but the, the national language in Uganda is English. So it's, it's, it's the medium of expression, is the language used in schools, the medium of instruction, it's English. And if we didn't have English, which connects all of us, we would struggle to understand each other because of these so many you know, local languages. If I wrote in my mother tongue, which has about half a million users, I would be aiming for not only for, for, for less than half a million because some of them are unable to read or write. So I'd be aiming for a very small group of people. So I write in English. Thank you, Goretti, for explaining it so well. I do, and, and thank you, us too, for, for your question. Uh, uh, it is an interesting question indeed, because um, we, I think we are all concerned about our local languages and yes, we do write in English because that has almost become our, 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 for some children, like the children who have grown up in town, that becomes their first language. They may not be able to express themselves in, uh, in, their, in their parents' local languages. And so, yes, we do write a lot and publish. Uh, all, almost all our publishing is in, in, uh, in English. But there are some efforts at, uh, uh, at writing in local languages. For example, we've run uh, some workshops in writing in local languages with some uh, some experts from uh, from local language initiatives at femright we have even attempted publishing in local languages we become we, we, you know we 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 task ourselves we we just had a a, a book uh, go tell home it's uh, one of our new poetry collections and what we said was, let's challenge ourselves. Let each person who contributes a poem try to put it in local language. And if they can't get it, let them ask. So it, it was a challenge. And uh, almost everybody uh, ended up with a translation. And then we went to, to look for editors in those different local languages. Sometimes it was challenging, but yeah, they, we, we, we try. It's very difficult, as uh, Goretta has explained. There are few readers in those languages, but at the same time, we cannot say we leave them. Uh, we, we, we do not focus on them. The, uh, also, the government, there's a, 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 there's a new, uh, sometime back, when I was in school, we studied in, in local language up to some level. And then later it became all English. And then, but a few years back, they returned the local language aspect. So the children are supposed to start with the local language. And so to support the government initiatives as well, 
yes, we also do have a few activities to promote local languages. We, we, I, I, sometimes I do poetry in, in my local language because you, 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 know, you realize that really local language sometimes captures things that English will not be able to capture. Yeah. And so, yeah, you go ahead and you do, you do that. There are challenges, but we cannot leave the local language uh, because of those challenges. No, we tackle them and see what comes next. Thank you. Um, the, the one of the things that I uh, had had uh, wondered about, uh, and uh, Garetti, uh, Hilda, I'd, I've been reading so many of the um, from right books, but there's a collection, and I forgot who did it, um, where there's a collection of of um, stories uh, or narratives that were told to you from women mm -hmm. in a refugee camp. And I know you're working, Hilda, with South Sudanese women, but this is one that's already published. I forgot the title of it. Uh, and my question then is that you are going to a refugee camp to collect stories by uh, from women whose language you don't speak. So you have to have a translator. And then the stories got translated again into English to be par become part of this book. So, I mean, I just see all kinds of layers of complications. I don't know if either one of you remember what the title of the book is, but I know that you're also doing a similar thing at the refugee camp with Su South Sudanese women, Hilda. Uh, I think it is Farming Ashes, which is uh, from uh, Northern Uganda, Farming yeah. Ashes. Yeah, yeah. But because of that complication, we actually ended up with two anthologies. Yes, that's, uh, that's the book. I gave so, it to her. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you reaching for it. This is one of the treasures that Sandy lent me, so I had to show. No. Actually, you have that. Uh, Hilda gave it to me, so it's it's a gift to, from um, from me and Hilda. We're treasuring it. <laughs> yeah. So because of those complications, we ended up doing two publications. So there is Farming Ashes, which is a total translation uh, translation into English, but there is also Today You Will Understand, and so Today ah. You Will Understand. It's also uh, the stories we are collected together with farming ashes, but we have the voices of the women. So we retained the voices of the women and there's a CD. Each book has a, a pocket with a CD, uh, which can then be played uh, for, for the local language speakers, because we felt that uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of layers that the English did not manage to, to capture. Yes, yeah, so I hear you, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> are there other questions um, from our poets, uh, poetry readers? Oh, Tola. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, I'll, I'll try to make it as fast as possible. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. It's it's really an honor to like have you to have you both um here. So my research, I I work on African feminism in um literary um productions from Africa as a whole. And I'm also looking at like issues of um how has African feminism changed over the years? How are women being represented? And what are the issues that basically concern women in these um, literary representations? So I think due to this, and because I also used to work with um, a publishing firm in Nigeria, I'm, I'm very interested in the kinds of, the criteria for the books that you publish. How do you how do you select your stories and how do you select your writers apart from um, maybe the fact that they are women? I think what I'm asking is basically how how do you um, what constitutes feminism? What are the kinds of representations that you look for when you choose the stories uh, that you that you want to publish? And if you are going to answer that, we only have a couple of minutes left. <laughs> okay, um, I'll go first and I'll be quick. And I'll just say 
that when we are choosing the books, we feminism is completely silent. We are not thinking about feminism. We are only thinking about a good story. But as it turns out, uh, you will find that the stories in the end are tackling, um, some of them are tackling feminism. And uh, how we do it is that is the, we do have an editorial board. So all the work that we get for consideration for publishing goes through um, a publishing, uh, an editorial board. We have a, an, an editorial policy, um, yeah, so we do not think about the, the concept of feminism when we are going, when we are choosing which book to publish. And Goretti, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, publishing through the, the trust, the Africa Writers, African Writers Trust? Well, we don't, we are not really a publishing outfit per se. What uh, we have published is the resultant of the training workshops. So we, we hold training workshops and editing and for emerging publishers. So the little that we have published is, is what originates from those trainings. So that the people we train as a continuation of the training process, they will work with the editors or the publishers who have trained them to talk to polish up the, their work. So as a trust, we are not a publishing outfit. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, everybody. Oh, uh, Hilda, were you gonna say something else? No. Um, you know, this has been very fascinating. Um, and someone is asking, what does it take for one to publish with you? Uh, we won't have time to address that. Um, the, um, the, uh, our time is running out, but you see uh, Hilda, and Goretti, we really want to get you back here to Madison so that we can engage with the younger group of women who have these issues because uh, there are things, you know, there's a big generational gap here in terms of the way we approach um, issues of feminism, especially on the continent, uh, even in, or even in black communities here in the US. So there's lots to talk about, lots of us for, uh, for us to, uh, to engage with as soon as things are better and the university will allow us to, uh, to sponsor travel. Laurie, I turn it over to you for yeah. uh, final remarks. I just want to thank you all so much. I, I echo what, um, what Dr. Adele is saying about how we really turn to young scholars and scholars around the world for leadership. Thank you all. Um, I also, um, I just want to say something that came, you know, a summative remark. What we choose to read is a really really important moral choice. And we are choosing to read and listen to these voices. I've been reading some of the poetry um, from, from Farming Ashes and from Beyond the Dance. And so I just think reading together is really important. I hear you, Goretti and Hilda, trying to make more time to read. And then these issues of what is translation and how to enter, feminism can sometimes be another language for many, right? So how we, and I, I guess I just think the multiplicity of ways of saying things. And in this modern world, deciding whether we're going to speak in one language or the other, it's like saying, am I gonna have an apple or a ban banana? Well, today I'll have an apple and tomorrow I'll have a banana. So, you know, the idea of embracing um, the inclusion and we're choosing to read you and thank you for the beginning, uh, Dr. Adele, of what I hope is a continued collaboration. There's so many possibilities of how we can keep coming together. And I know we will. I have, I have confidence that we will. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. And have a very, very uh, nice day, wonderful day or evening. Continue joining us. We have more activities and things going on um, uh, here at the conference. Thank you, Tola, Astu, and Agnes. It was a wonderful thing working with you all. Bye-bye, sure. everyone. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye.